Hello everyone and welcome to lecture today. So today we're going to be uh, moving along into systems and uh, you know talking about some of the basic theory for systems of ordinary differential equations. Uh, we'll start off with a little bit of review. And this is the concept we're going to review the concepts of vectors uh, and then specifically the, the norm of a vector. So we can think of a vector is a quantity with both magnitude and direction which represents points in in general and dimensional space Which we denote R n to denote the Cartesian product of R with itself n times. And remember that if A and B are vectors in R n, we can write them in terms of their. Um, components and A will just denote A1, A2 all the way to AN and B will denote B1, B2 all the way to BN And you'll remember that we have several different ways in, in 3D of multiplying vector, vectors, the top product, the cross product. Uh, for now, we'll just uh, uh, write down the formula for the dot product. It is the multiplication of components of each vector added together. And using this idea, we can define the length or uh, two norm, as it's sometimes called because there are actually multiple different ways of defining a length of a vector in a vector space. I'll recall that the length or two norm of a vector is defined as the square root of the dot product of the vector a with itself or in component notation the square root of a1 squared plus a2 squared all the way up to a n squared and this quantity gives us, um, in some sense, the size of the vector A. Um, in, uh, in any number of dimensions, this is just the length of the hypotenuse of uh, you know, the, the big triangle formed by the, all the components of the vector itself um, in any number of dimensions.
we can use the norm to define, uh, for instance, the unit vector in the direction of A. And this is very often noted with a hat on it. Um, there are many notations for vectors. You can put an arrow over the symbol or an underline under the symbol. Um, I prefer to put the underline under the symbol. But whenever you see a quantity with an underline un under it, it means it's a vector in some dimensional space. Um, so the unit vector pointing in the direction of A is the vector A itself divided by its magnitude or it's two norm. And let's just make a little bit more room up here. So some famous unit vectors that you've probably seen in uh, 3D are i hat, which is 1, 0, 0, j hat, which is 0, 1, 0, and k hat, which is 0, 0, 1. We will be using this a little bit later on in the lecture um, and later on in the course as well. So this is why it's important to get um, this notation down. Um, See, so we can also use the norm to define the distance function of the distance between two vectors. A and B is the norm of B minus A or A minus B. Uh, this is going to be very useful for us uh, because this is going to allow us to define, you know, stability uh, in general. Uh, our stability of an equilibrium point for a general uh, system of differential equations. And we'll see how to do that a little bit later on in the lecture today. And the last thing that we're going to be using uh, in today's lecture is the concept of a vector valued function. parametric curve and this is a function from the real numbers. So there's one input but it maps into n-dimensional space and this takes the form of component functions where you have n component functions f1 of t f2 of t all the way to fn of t and 
and these are going to be the uh, this little bit of vector vector calculus is going to be the uh, you know a little bit that we need for today to um, to use and to extend uh, a lot of the ideas that we've developed so far for um, single differential equations. We say that a system. Uh, first order ordinary differential equations is a system of the form y1 dot where dot here stands for the derivative with respect to t. So du dt is the same thing as u dot. y1 dot is equal to f1 of y1, y2 to yn and t. y2 dot is equal to f2 of y1, y2, and possibly all of the y's up until including yn. And uh, we have in general n first order ODEs. So we have n equations of this form, n functions of uh, all of the values y1 through yn. and of t. And this is in general a system of n first order ordinary differential equations. And if any of the yi's, or I should say the fi's, for i from 1 to n, are nonlinear functions. These are all multivariable functions. So if any of them are nonlinear functions of any of the yj's, then this is a nonlinear. system of ODEs. So what's nice about this is that this can be actually uh, abbreviated using um, uh, our, our vector notation. It can be abbreviated very, very concisely actually. Um, if we call y of t a vector valued function, so y is the vector y1, y2, all the way to yn. And each one of these y1, y2, y, yn's are these functions that we're talking about up here. Um, this system of differential equations is the same thing as the vector y dot 
is equal to f of y comma t And I'll actually bring this down here where y is uh, all of the functions y1 through yn of t and The, the function f of y comma t is the vector of functions f1 of y1 to yn comma t, f2 of y1 to yn comma t, all the way down to fn of y1 to yn comma t. Um, for any given system uh, of ordinary differential equations, uh, we typically have uh, an initial value uh, that needs to be specified, uh, in, in which case we'll have an initial value problem. Uh, if instead uh, certain functions are specified at multiple different points, then we have what's called a boundary value problem, which in general are more difficult to solve. So in, in this class, we'll typically be considering initial value problems. This is of the form y of t naught is equal to y naught. Then solving the above ODE system. and satisfying the initial value constitutes the solution of the initial value problem. an IVP. definition that I want to make and that is that a system of first order ordinary differential equations is called autonomous if the forcing functions, it's sometimes called, or I shouldn't say forcing function, the right hand side or f function does not depend on 
explicitly on T. And I want to make a note here because all of the theory that we're going to develop is going to be for uh, autonomous differential equations, or auto autonomous systems of differential equations. But just like I, I, I mentioned previous, uh, and for first order autonomous differential equations, um, an autonomous or non autonomous system of differential equations can always be rewritten as uh, an autonomous system of differential equations by adding one extra differential equation. And this is done in exactly the same way that I mentioned uh, a few lectures ago, which is that uh, suppose we have a non-autonomous system where y is equal to y1 through yn. As from before, And F is as before as well. So we have F is a function of Y and of T. If we consider the new variable Xi which has one more component, we define xi as y1, y2, all the way down to yn, and the last component of xi is t. Then xi prime, or the derivative of xi, is going to be equal to the derivative of y1, the derivative of y2, all the way down to the derivative of yn, and the derivative of t is just equal to 1. Which helps us because we know that all of the yn's satisfy this differential equation right here, this system of differential equations right here. So y1 dot is going to be f1 of all of the y's and t, f2 of all of the y's and t, and so on and so forth, all the way down to fn of all of the y's and t. And then uh, the last component of that prime is just one. And now because xi has n plus one components, right, this is xi one, xi two, all the way down to xi n, and t is the xi n plus first component. This new system of differential equations, xi dot is equal to g 
of his eye. He is in the autonomous system. of n plus 1 ODEs due to the fact that each one of these, this is xi1 all the way to xi n, xi n plus 1 I this function right here is the g function. Now it's important to point out here that if um, even if this is a linear system of ODEs uh, if it's, um, you know, it can be linear in y and it's still a linear system of ODEs, even if it's nonlinear in T. Um, but um, the new system that you get here, if if this is nonlinear in T, but it's still a linear differential equation, this will become a, a nonlinear system of ODEs because of the nonlinearity uh, with respect to T in this in the, one of these functions, possibly. Um, that that's the only real caveat here of doing this. So. Uh, this is uh, a very, very nice approach and a very, very powerful approach. And the reason that, um, you know, the, the theorem that we're about to get, go over is very, very powerful. So just like um, in the, the single variable or the, the single uh, variable or single equation case we have a big theorem now um, and this is if and this is all going to reference the initial value problem um, with G as a forcing function so we say if G from RN to RN is continuous then for each value t naught in R and initial condition in Rn the initial value problem Psi prime is equal to G of Xi with corresponding initial value Xi of T naught is equal to Xi naught as a solution. Xi of t. So this gives us uh, existence of a solution if this is a continuous mapping from n dimensional space into n dimensional space. Furthermore, the solution Xi of t has some maximal interval of existence and we'll use the same notation that we used in 1D where alpha is the lower bound of this interval of existence it could be negative infinity Uh, less than t naught, whereas the initial condition t value in our interval, which is less than omega, which is less than or equal to positive infinity. And just like before, if alpha is greater than, strictly greater than negative infinity. The limit as t goes to alpha plus 
worker alpha from the right hand side of the norm of the solution or size of the solution as a function of t is equal to positive infinity so this is saying that if the maximum in that interval of, of existence or the minimum value in the interval of existence is uh, you know a real number so it's not equal to negative infinity then uh, the size of the solution has to diverge to a positive infinity and likewise if the upper bound for that maximum interval of existence is not positive infinity, then the limit as t approaches the upper bound of that interval of existence from the left of the size of the solution has to approach positive infinity. And this is uh, very, very similar to um, the, the condition from you know, what we saw in the first order case. Uh, and likewise, we have that. Um, so if in addition that this function g has continuous First order partial derivatives with respect to xi one, xi two, and all of the other variables. then the above IVP has a unique solution. So uh, continuity of this function G gives us the existence of a solution with certain properties. Um, but uh, it doesn't give us uniqueness. Uniqueness will come from having partial derivatives. And just like for the, the first theorem, I'm not going to prove this theorem. It's a little bit advanced, uh, but it is in the book, just like the, the first one. So I recommend looking, looking that up and uh, you know, learning a little bit more about that if you're, you're interested in the proof of this theorem. But for us, in terms of applications uh, to models, uh, we just need the existence and the uniqueness. Um, uh, and this will very often be enough. Sometimes it's not enough. You have to look a little bit harder at the problem you're dealing with. Um, but um, this, this is enough for now for us to get started understanding um, multivariable um, or multiple, uh, sing multiple first order ODEs. define an equilibrium point of an autonomous system call such a system like this star
is a point xi star, we'll call it, such that g of xi star is equal to the zero vector. And this means equivalently that um, n system of equations hold. You have that G1 of xi1 star, xi2 star, because xi star is a point in n dimensional space, all the way up to xi n star is 0. G2 of xi1 star, xi2 star, all the way up to xi n star is 0. And you have a simultaneous system uh, of equations that has to be solved uh, to find a, a given critical point. And in general, if this is a nonlinear system of ODEs, this is a nonlinear system that you have to solve to solve for the equilibrium points of a given system. make some classifications similar to, uh, and I shouldn't say similar, uh, in almost the exact same wording uh, of all of the things that we talked about um, in the, the 1D case. We say that um, an isolated equilibrium point, or we'll denote this for short, EP, just like before, is an equilibrium point such that the following holds. If there exists a delta, such that f of x is non-zero, for all x not necessarily equal to the equilibrium point because we know that it's zero there but for all x around the equilibrium point inside the delta region this is saying that if point xi star is an equilibrium point there exists a possibly very, very small region of points around that equilibrium point such that none of these points inside this small region are themselves equilibrium points. That's what this statement is saying right here. Notice that uh, we use the concept of norm here, or distance, and um, this set of points within uh, distance delta of a given point uh, zeta star is sometimes called the delta ball around the point uh, xi star in n-dimensional space. Um, so basically this is saying that um, this is the, the punctured delta ball because the origin xi star is removed, but this is saying that um, it, 
equilibrium point is isolated if there exists a punctured delta ball around xi star such that none of the points in that punctured delta ball are equilibrium points. We say that an equilibrium point is stable if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if the initial condition of the differential equation xi naught is close enough to the equilibrium point so within delta of the equilibrium point then the distance between the solution of the differential equation at time t corresponding to this initial condition y naught or uh, xi naught is within epsilon or stays within epsilon of the equilibrium point. This is saying that um, equilibrium point is stable if uh, for any um, size epsilon ball you can draw around that equilibrium point. This is I star here, equilibrium point. For any epsilon ball that you can draw around the equilibrium point, there will always exist uh, possibly very small delta ball around that equilibrium point such that any of the initial conditions in that start inside this delta ball uh, the solution will stay inside the epsilon ball the loose solution remains uh, inside this epsilon ball right here for all t now, these pictures are in one dimension but in general this is uh, this works in any number of dimensions because the norm Right, works in any number of dimensions for defining distance. We say that an equilibrium point is asymptotically stable if it is stable and there exists a delta naught, some positive delta naught, such that any solutions starting inside the delta naught ball around the equilibrium point so if uh, xi naught is within delta of xi star then the limit of the solution as t goes to infinity of the differential equation phi or the, the solution phi of t with initial condition y naught is equal to this equilibrium point. And lastly we can say that an equilibrium point is unstable if it is not stable.
And there, there are other types of stability that you can introduce and, and look at, uh, such as semi-stability, um, a, lot, a lot of different things that you can do. Um, use exponential stability. Um, is, but the, the idea here is this is these are the basic definitions that uh, we want to be aware of and understand for now. This is sometimes called Lyapunov stability. After the great Russian mathematician um, Alexander Lyapunov. who pioneered the, this research, uh, or a lot of this stability research, back in his thesis in 1892. Um, and we'll, we'll actually learn uh, a little bit more about that a little bit later on. Um, but I, I want to uh, emphasize, right, that um, uh, this is a very, 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 very important concept um, to understand that this concept applies not just in 2D or 3D, but Right, in any dimensional phase space. In, in general, we, we say that uh, this, this space, right, uh, Rn, is uh, the phase space of the differential system. So uh, in R1, when we're studying single equations, you know, um, the phase space was a line. It was a phase line. Uh, for a system of two, uh, differential equations, we have what's called the phase plane of the differential uh, equation system. Uh, for a system of three differential equations, uh, our phase space is three-dimensional space, and, and so on, uh, so on and so forth. All right, uh, phase space for a system of n uh, differential equations is n-dimensional space. So this is why it's important that our concept of distance in n-dimensional Euclidean space is there and we have this nice concept of distance with the norm. It's also important, I'll point, I'll point this out right here, that um, This is more of a notation. Typically, uh, when we talk about solution, of the ODE star from before, we'll be talking about uh, and using notation phi of xi T with, uh, if we want to, sometimes the initial condition will be specified, sometimes it's not. So if we specify the initial condition, uh, th this, is, this just means the solution of this above system of differential equations. And that's what we were using here. The next and you know, final couple topics that we want to extend from single first order equations to systems of first order equations are uh, you know, properties about the continuity of solutions. So we have a theorem that states that uh, for each t, in the maximal interval of existence, or in a maximal interval of, of existence. The solution B of xi or p of t passing through a point xi not and really we'll just say passing through a point xi is continuous as a function of xi And uh, I 
again, I will be proving this theorem just like the, the, the previous main theorem on existence uh, and uniqueness of solutions. Uh, this proof is, is in Kelly chapter 8. But, uh, and actually a more general result is proved there. However, you know, it's just important for us to have these results so we can, we can be confident when we're writing down our differential equations uh, and, you know, modeling, using these models uh, that come from systems. We want to also extend the idea of orbits, and this has a nice uh, definitive extension to systems. Um, say if xi of t is a solution, and the solution that we're talking about is to uh, you know, the initial value from the star, so if xi of t is a solution of star on a maximal interval of existence from, for t from alpha to omega, then the set Xi of t such that since there are points in phase space, xi of t such that t is in this maximal interval of, of existence is a subset of Rn and it's called an orbit. of the ODE. And uh, the concept of orbit in the general phase space uh, involves collecting, uh, you know, first solving for all of the critical points, and then uh, collecting all of the solutions in a, give, a given, um, you know, in a given orbit that's separated between all of the uh, intervals of existence, just like in um, the, the one-dimensional case. We also have a similar shifting theorem. And that's if xi of t satisfies the differential equation, the system, on some interval from C to D, so for T in such an interval, then For any constant h, function nu of t, which is defined as xi of t plus h, also satisfies um, the od star. This is on the new interval from C plus H to D plus H. Oh, and this should be, sorry, this should be shifted xi of T minus H. And 
Furthermore, we can prove very, very nicely that if two orbits of the differential equation star have a common point, then the orbits are identical. This is a theorem that I'll go through the proof of because it's relatively straightforward. So we'll assume that xi of t solves the differential equation on some interval from C to D and define nu of T to be the solution xi of T but shifted by H. or t in the interval from c plus h to d plus h. And uh, if we differentiate eta, this is the same thing as differentiating eta 1 to eta n. which by definition of eta is the same thing as xi 1 prime of t minus h times 1 from the chain rule down to xi n prime of t minus h times 1 again times the chain rule. same thing as xi prime of t minus h times 1 but because uh, xi prime satisfies the differential equation this is the same thing as saying that eta prime of t is exactly equal to this function g of xi of t minus h or g of eta. This is how we define eta, eta of t. Um, so there you have it. This is the proof of part one. And the proof of part two of the theorem is a little bit more involved, um, but it uses the shifting theorem, the proof of part one. So if we assume that xi one of t and xi two of t are solutions to the differential equation star and um, we also assume that they have a common point which means that at some point t1 xi1 of t is equal to xi2 of t we can go through and um, uh, directly show 
that these uh, any two trajectories at the common point have to be equal. We can do this by introducing uh, an auxiliary function, um, so we'll call consider nu of t, which is defined as xi2 of t, but shifted by t1 and also shifted by t2, so minus t1 plus t2. xi of t, or uh, eta of t, satisfies d o d e. And uh, this is directly because of the shifting theorem from before. We're just shifting this by a positive h, uh, or a negative h, depending on what the value of t2 minus t1 is. And because of this, uh, and the fact that if you consider what the value of eta of t1 is, eta of t1 is equal to xi2 of t1 minus t1 plus t2, or just xi2 of t2, which means that at this eta of t1, this is equal to the point xi2 of t2. And because of, um, uh, from uh, the, the, the main existence uniqueness theorem, if we have a unique solution, then this means that this new shifted function, eta of t, has to be identical to x. Or, sorry, not x, but uh, xi1 of t. for all t in uh, the maximal in interval of existence, or for all t from alpha to t on this orbit. This proves the, the theorem for us because um, if this if this has to be true, uh, this means then that xi two of t minus t one plus t two, which is just eta of t, has to be equal to xi one of t for all on the orbit from alpha to t to omega and uh, this exactly gives us uh, what we want because it's, it's saying that um, really uh, any two solutions uh, on a maximal interval existence the same orbit um, that cross one another uh, are, ju are just related to one another and exactly the same as one another for all t we just have to shift um, the possible parameterizations uh, of the two solutions. Um, so the, these uh, two theorems are very, very powerful and will give us some uh, very, very nice uh, results when we go to, uh, to argue and you know, make certain uh, arguments about some of the systems that we're going to encounter. And uh, you know, all of these results uh, can be applied to the, the general population models that we've discussed so far, uh, which is, are very nice. And um, the idea is that 
Uh, those are the first real examples that we'll see. In, in, in the next lecture, we'll see a number of different examples from mechanics and how to deal with certain problems from um, mechanics of motion. Um, and, um, you know, these new examples will show, you know, far and wide that this is the, uh, the, the best way of going through and understanding a given system uh, is to develop the theory and then go through and you know, apply it to uh, applied problems. So I want to note here that the orbits of star partition the phase space Rn, uh, which means that essentially you know, these two theorems allow us to conclude that um, each point of Rn lies on exactly one orbit. Let's get into some examples. I want to go through and show uh, how to, you know, apply some of the theory we've talked about in the the, the previous uh, couple pages. Um, and the best way to do that is by looking at some simple examples. So, let's consider the differential equation xi, the system of differential equations where xi is x y and d xi dt, or xi dot for short, is equal to negative, or uh, y, negative x. So this is right hand side here is our function g of xi. This is a function of the two variables x and y, and this is a function of the two variables x and y. And uh, not only that, this is an autonomous system of uh, first order ODEs. Specifically that x dot is equal to y, and y dot is equal to negative x. So the, the idea here is that, you know, uh, very often when we go through to determine the uh, uh, trajectories and phase plays, phase space to get the, the uh, phase diagram, uh, in this case the phase plane of the system, uh, we can use uh, various results from calculus, specifically from the impl implicit function theorem. We have this really nice result that um, the derivative of y with respect to x is going to be the same thing as the derivative of y with respect to t divided by the derivative of x with respect to t. Right, and this is assuming that its functions are nice enough and that um, the main thing here is that x dot is non-zero. So this then gives the equation well, y dot is negative x and x dot is y. So this gives us a new differential equation that holds inside the phase plane. And this new differential equation is a separable differential equation that when we uh, multiply both sides by y and then integrate, we get the uh, antiderivative of y dy is equal to 
is equal to uh, the antiderivative of negative x dx, which gives y squared over 2 is equal to negative x squared over 2 plus c, which is the same thing as the implicit equation x squared plus y squared is equal to 2 times c, or d for short. This is just an arbitrary constant of integration. By the way, before we even go through and solve this, uh, we can classify the equilibrium points. This is going to have equilibrium points when y equals 0 and when negative x is equal to 0. So we have an equilibrium point at the origin. And then after the, uh, the process of going through and solving uh, for the actual shape of the phase curves, we see that these phase curves or orbits in phase space are going to take the form of circles that are all centered at this equilibrium point. And the circles have a radius of the square root of d, whatever that is. Um, because this is what the level curves of this function look like. Um, by the way, th this solution method is the same solution method that you can go through and do to find the solution to the, the um, original log of Volterra system that we discussed earlier, um, which is very neat. But um, one of the things that we can point out is that this equilibrium point is going to be a stable equilibrium point but not an asymptotically stable equilibrium point. And we can see that, and this is not going to be a direct proof of this, but it is going to be just kind of a, a picture showing why this is a stable equilibrium point. For any epsilon, no matter how small uh, you choose to draw around this equilibrium point, there will always be a corresponding delta region or delta ball around this equilibrium point such that for any initial condition in delta the solution will stay within the epsilon ball. This is true for any size epsilon ball no matter how small you want to go with the epsilon ball because the, the orbits are always circles for this, uh, in this equation. Um, but it's not asymptotically stable because for no, none of these orbits right, the, uh, there, there exists no small enough interval or small enough delta ball uh, that uh, solutions inside of it converge to the, the equilibrium point. There, there is no such delta ball. Um, so this is just a quick explanation of why this equilibrium point is stable but not asymptotically stable. <coughs> so uh, the next example that we'll consider is actually a second order ordinary differential equation for x. Let's say that x is equal to x minus x cubed. And um, right at the beginning, you can say, well, uh, the theory that we just covered doesn't cover second order ODEs. And specifically, this is a second order nonlinear ODE. So uh, you can ask, well, what do we do? And uh, the easiest thing to do is to rewrite this as a system of first order ODEs by defining y, a new variable y, as x prime with the derivative of x. We can rewrite this system of ODEs as x prime is equal to y 
and because y is equal to x prime, x double prime is equal to y prime. So y prime is equal to x minus x cubed. And this is a system of two first order nonlinear ODEs, which is equivalent to the system that we start, or the single differential equation that we started with. This is also an autonomous system. So uh, we can go through and apply the theory that we've just kind of constructed. Equilibrium points are where y equals zero and where x times one minus x squared equals zero. And this can be satisfied in two ways. The first one is where x equals zero or where x is equal to plus or minus one. So to get an idea of uh, what this, this phase space is going to look like, we have a two-dimensional space for our orbits. Uh, we're going to have three equilibrium points, one right here, one right here, and one right here. And um, one of the things that, that helps us out is to draw what are called the null clines um, for this system right here. The null clines are the line x equals 0 and the line y equals 0. These intersect at the origin, which is the intersection of null clines are always the critical points. And you can see very clearly here that this null line corresponds to y prime equals zero. Is at any point for any trajectory on this null line, uh, y is not changing. And same thing for this null line right here, x prime is equal to zero. So for any point on this null line, x prime x is the derivative x is not changing. Um, this might not be super well visualized here because uh, of the fact that is a freehand drawing and it's being drawn to scale. I really want to emphasize this. So the rate of change of x here is zero on this, this circle. Very, very hard to draw uh, a circle freehand. But uh, what's nice about this, these implicit curves is that you can directly visualize them using Desmos as well. So we'll see that uh, when we you know, get the form for this right here, uh, this equation right here, we want to be able to visualize this using Desmos. Um, but so uh, we can visualize the null clines of this equation in a similar manner. Uh, we'll do the, the, when y equals zero, that corresponds to x prime equals zero. So the first main null cline is this curve right here. This is x dot is equal to zero for any point in this curve. And the second null cline is of course going to correspond to all of the x values and y values for which the derivative of y is equal to zero. 
and that corresponds to these three curves right here. So one of the things about null clines is that you can always um, determine the direction of solution away from the null clines in the phase space for the previous example. And on the null clines, the various values of the derivative of the quantities are zero. However, as we move away from the null lines, we can always determine the, the, the sign uh, of each of these values um, and uh, put in, you know, obtain exactly what direction the solution is traveling away from the null lines. So the, the, the solution curves for uh, this solution are very interesting and um, we're seeing that it's it's very kind of split up here so you might not initially see what the solution curves are but luckily this example uh, can be solved uh, just like we did before um, so if we re recall the, by the implicit function theorem that dy dx is going to equal y dot over x dot and x dot is non-zero. Then we get that this is going to be equal to x minus x cubed over y. which is, again, a separable different differential equation for x and y. So we can go through and uh, this is going to be then the integral of y dy. Antiderivative of y dy is going to be the antiderivative of x minus x cubed dx, which gives us that y squared over 2 is equal to x squared over 2 minus x to the fourth over 4 plus some constant c. So uh, we'll multiply by 2 to simplify this a little bit, but ultimately this becomes then the curve x to the fourth over 2 plus y squared minus x squared is equal to c, or 2 times c, where we'll call 2 times c d for short. So the, the orbits of this uh, system of differential equations in phase space are given by the level curves of this function. For various values of d, this is going to have various shapes. And um, the shapes are actually very, very interesting here. Um, We actually have, so for the circle problem, the only valid value of d was positive or zero. Zero being that the critical point or the equilibrium point, and then positive values of d being right, circles around the origin. However, for this example, uh, negative values of d and positive values of d uh, give us um, a, 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 a solution. So the idea is that we have to be very, very careful here when we're plotting out the level curves of this function. So let's, let's take a look at this in Desmos and um, try and uh, get uh, the desired result. So 
This is the Desmos plot. And um, I've included a plot of the, um, the, the null clines, specifically the when y equals zero and when uh, x equals zero, one, or minus one. So we have the critical points here and the null clines. And then if we go through and plot that solution that we just found, x squared or x to the fourth over two plus y squared minus x squared is equal to d. And we add a slider for d. We see that these curves for various values of d can be very interesting when d is less than critical value here. We don't have any curves. But then uh, when d is around negative 0.3, you have curves that look like this. Up until the point where d is 0. This curve, by the way, when d equals 0 is uh, sometimes called the separatri separatrix or separatrix because it separates two distinct types of solutions or orbits from one another. Um, so uh, when d is, you know, not too small, but small, uh, less than zero, we have two separate orbits in our phase space. And when d goes to zero, and I'll make this range a little bit better. So we'll go from negative 0.3 to maybe um, positive two in steps of 0.001. So we can really see the clean distinction between the types of orbits. We can go a little bit lower than 0.3, maybe to 0.5. So you see that for negative values of d, you have uh, orbits that look like this. Up until you hit d equals zero, which gives you this orbit right here. And then for larger values of d, so greater than zero, you get orbits that take on this shape right here. So if we draw out some of these orbits, uh, we'll do negative point uh, three. negative point four negative point two negative point one zero orbits where this is positive solid blue or uh, solid red I'll color uh, the separatrix orbit of black and then uh, all of the negative values will dash the lines or dot, dot the lines and color them blue. So you can better see this, this plot right here. But this is, uh, you know, in the phase plane, what the orbits of this uh, system of differential equations look like. Um, and they, they represent the solutions, right? These orbits represent the solutions of that first order, uh, or that first uh, single second order ODE.
which is really cool. So what we're seeing here is that we have this separatrix curve. Oops. And yeah, it looks like this. And like this. This is my definitely not to scale freehand drawing. for any orbit inside this region, any initial condition inside this region, the orbit goes around this critical point, goes around this critical point, And then uh, for any initial condition outside of the separatrix, you get a, a solution curve that takes this general peanut shape. solutions are essentially classified by, by uh, this, this work that we've done, uh, which is very, very cool. And uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is that I mentioned uh, is that uh, this method that we've applied to this last example is typical of any higher order single ODE. So uh, any single higher order ordinary differential equation can be rewritten. as a system of first order ODEs. Sometimes called the equivalent system. So suppose we have the first order ODE. We have a very general first order ODE or a nth order ODE. And this takes the form of um, a general function of the form, a multivariable function, f of t, y, y dot, y double dot, where dot here again is just the derivative notation that we introduced before. And in general, it can depend on all of the derivatives up to and including the nth derivative of our unknown function y. Is that equal to zero? This is uh, the form that any nth order ODE will take. And um, just 
just like in the last example, which is a second order ODE that we reduced to a system of first order ODEs, uh, we can do that for any given general example. We define why not, uh, this is uh, not a critical point notation, this is just why not, or why this is a function of p, that y not is equal to y, y1 is equal to y not prime. It's the same thing as y prime. y2 is equal to y1 prime. And instead of the primes, I'll stick with the same notation, the dot notation that I'm using up here. And y2 will define as y1 dot, which in reality is the second derivative of y. And we can do this procedure all the way up to uh, y n minus 2 is defined to be equal to. n minus 3 dot and I'll make a little bit more space over here this is really just the n minus second derivative of y in disguise in our new notation and we do this all the way up until y n minus 1 which is defined as being equal to y n minus 2 uh, or y n minus 2 prime which is really just the n minus first derivative of y in disguise and so uh, this constitutes a system of n minus 1 equations. Uh, the first equation is for y dot. And this is saying that y naught prime is equal to y1. second equation is for y double prime and this is that y1 prime is equal to y2 and this continues all the way down to equation and minus 2 which is an equation really defining the n minus second derivative of y this is the equation that y n minus 3 dot is equal to let's make some room here because I want to really indicate why this is a system of n minus 1 equations so y minus 3 dot is equal to y n minus 2 And then lastly, our n minus first equation, which is for n minus first derivative of y, is saying that y n minus 2 is equal to y n minus 1. 
and so this is only n minus 1 equations, but the last equation here, or the nth equation that completes the system, is then just going to be that relationship between all of these variables, which is that f of t, comma, y0, y1, plus y2, all the way up to y n minus 2, y n minus 1, and then lastly, the nth derivative of y, which is y n minus 1 dot, is equal to 0. This system of n first order differential equations is in general equivalent to the single nth order equation that we started with. And uh, the only other uh, possible caveat which sometimes occurs is if this function is a complicated function of this last derivative uh, which uh, it very well may be but uh, very often we can express this uh, in terms of the notation we had before um, if we can solve for that last derivative y n minus 1 dot in terms of everything else specifically we'll say let's say we can solve for y n minus 1 dot equal that and it's equal to some function lowercase f of t comma y naught y one to y n minus one then uh, we attain a system of first order order e's that is of the form that we talked about before. So uh, where xi is y y naught y1 all the way up to yn minus 1 and then xi prime the derivative is y naught prime or y naught y1 prime all the way to y n minus 1 prime. This will be equal to y1 by 2 mm -hmm. all the way up to, and I, I'll include uh, some more of the n terms here so you really see what's going on. Two prime is y n minus one, and then the last expression here is this function, lowercase f of t and all of the y's. So in general, this is equal to then some vector function g of y comma t. So our initial, our initial 
nth order differential equation, uh, it can be rewritten as a system. This is a non-autonomous system if it depends on t. of first order ODEs. And this is a very common technique that we'll use um, whenever uh, we have an nth order uh, ODE. But uh, this will conclude today's lecture. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in. I hope you have a great day and that you learned something.